الصوت كويس؟ شعري وراس كبير فالمايكروفون ما بيمسكش فهيقع. اوكي دودلز دودلز فيرس ديجيتال سوري يا جماعه لو حد مش هيفهم سم اوف ذا ووردز ذات اي سي الكلام اللي هقوله بالانجليزي بس حابب مستريح اكتر لو اتكلمت بالانجليزي ومش هتقتئ وافقف وارتبك وحاجات غريبه تحصل ف I'll stick to English it's a lot easier and I hope you all understand I think it's been a fantastic day so far doodles versus digital uh, I got the idea when I decided I want to speak at TED ما كانش عندي conception I haven't invented anything I'm not the creator of nano technologies nor bio engineering of anything I am a guy who just sits and observes I think in many ways the one thing that has helped me get through in life is the fact that I'm foolish. And I think I love being foolish. And I think a lot of what I'm telling you remains to be highly insignificant. Right? It is. <laughs> it's just a little bit of a couple of doodles that go in my head. Um, I never got very clear instruction or direction, never had a mentor, never had a coach. A lot of the way that I was brought up happened through doodling. I used to like burning things when I was studying. Uh, it gave me a form of tuning into a slightly different frequency. So anyways, a talk about a few things that matter. It's a series of a lot of things. It's a menage, it's a soup, it's, it's a broth. Call it whatever you want to call it. It touches about on a lot of things that many of our great speakers have already talked about. So I seem to be a very good thief of ideas. I'll get to that in a bit. I work in advertising, it's highly unethical, and I don't recommend it to anybody, <laughs> nor their kids. So all that I'm doing today is I'm stealing ideas, I'm repackaging them, making them look good on a screen, and trying to get all the credit. That's my life. Let's find out what this life of mine is like. I'm happily married, and my wife is in the front row. She's my muse, as Tara Abu Naga coined her the first time we met. Um, as a result of being married, we got kids, crazy kids, amazingly crazy kids. They drive me in every single way that I can imagine. When you get a wife and kids, you have to get a dog, <laughs> right? So that came with the entire package. That is the pet peeve. No pun intended in my life. I hate our dog. I'm a techno geek. I have an iPhone and a Blackberry, believe it or not. I get the best of both worlds, right? I can look cool and I can remain connected. <laughs> I love photography. I love shooting. And again, once again, my wife helped me realize that by buying my first digital camera. And now she allows me to buy a lot of very expensive cameras. So I have a camera, three of them actually. I also love being foolish. Part of being foolish is to play games. I like playing games on gaming consoles, so I'm allowed to have a PS3 that my kids get to share with me as well. Now, I also like to move a lot, so part of gaming is doing gaming while you're moving. So I have a PSP and a DS, <laughs> right? It's important. And all of this stuff happily connects to, each, to, all, to, to a, a nice little device called a MacBook Pro. I'm a huge Mac fan. I hate PCs, I used to assemble them, and I just cannot live with them. Sorry, Steve Jobs. Way to go, way to go with, with what we've been able to achieve with Macs. And I'm happy, I'm happy seeing people who have no clue what they're talking about carrying an iPhone, at least they're spreading the disease. It's good, I want more Macs in the room. Now, to get all of this stuff, because this stuff doesn't come from free, right? I actually have to do something. And I have to be the evil guy who goes out and spreads diseases and, and all sorts of bad thoughts and convince people to buy things they don't, you don't need. But that's what you gotta do to earn some money, right? So it's actually not me, it's, this is me. And I told you this little story to try and get you to a conclusion, which is, if this guy has got all this bloody stuff, he must be pretty happy, right? I mean, you know, unconditionally happy. What more do you want? A house, a garden, a great wife, amazing kids, a PSP and a DS, a Blackberry and an iPhone, <laughs> right? And I've resisted to get the iPad, but donations are welcome. I mean, I'm, <laughs> Cool, I'm cool with it, no issues. So is this guy unconditionally happy? Let's try and answer that question as we go along. But I'll start with something that I think is, is innate in us. Sorry? Mike. Hello? Hello? Better? Okay, cool. Let, let's start with something. I gotta start under animating. 
I'm over animating, the mic flies off. Okay, one of the core things that exist in us from the day, from the dawn of time is this aspiration, right? We all have been created with a purpose. Whether we seek it or not, it's there. Whether we realize it or not, it's there, right? Now, this aspiration has driven the caveman to understand that a square wheel will not go very far. So he turned it into a circular wheel and so forth. Fast forward into technology. A lot of our aspirations have driven us and I'm echoing, echoing, echoing. The key question that I think underlines all of this is who am I? And I think a lot of the great speakers have actually, Hani's doing body language. Thank you, Hani. Okay, can you hear me now? Is it? Can you hear me now? Okay. I feel like Dr. Spock. Hello. Hello. Okay. Firas to Earth. Okay. We're there. The, 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 question, the question is, who am I? And I think a lot of the speakers, the mic's going off again. Sorry. Can I make life easier? Can I get a handheld microphone? Because my head's too big and the mic's going to keep falling. Let's be real. Okay. I'll keep going until I get that. The question of who am I, I think, haunts a lot of us. And in many ways, what has ended up happening is it's, it's, uh, the handheld is easier, man. Okay, can I remove this weird object? <laughs> Testing, yes. Now I feel like a star, much better. Okay. okay, this one is an important one. We need to take a nice deep breath and go back. The, the key question of identity, who we are, I think that question sort of has dawned upon us a very long time ago. Different people tackle it in different ways. Artists take it into the realm of the metaphysical and they, you know, they start getting all philosophical about it. And there's regular people who say, I'm just a regular you know, Joe Blow. I'm just a guy who has to work. See, throwing a bit of Arabic. Uh, so this key question, I think, will prevail throughout the presentation in many ways. So let's come back to it. I think what, what made me get a little um, more curious on how this question gets translated is looking at the factors that affect us as humans. From the day we're born, we start getting affected by different influencers. The first is family, right? Obviously, our families help us understand values and all sorts of amazing things that are right and wrong in life. Forgetting one small detail, which is they are accumulating their knowledge into what they call experiences that happened in a specific context. And they fail in most cases to try and understand that the context in which we are in is not relevant. So they try in all the goodwill and all the good faith, pass on those experiences as they are. As they are. Rahim mentioned that, and I think it's really important to understand it. The second is religion. God bless religion. I think it's fantastic. I think if Taken correctly, it helps people get perspective. It helps us move from thinking logically into thinking illogically, which is fantastic too. It's a form of insanity that helps you gain some sanity. I'll stop there so that I can actually end up going home today. We'll move on to schools. Schools are, again, a great idea gone horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. If I can pull my kids out of school, I will. And my wife can teach them because she's a fantastic teacher, and I will help teach them. Schools were, again, I get really, really nervous talking about this because I see how badly such a big influencer in the lives of millions and trillions of kids around the world can actually do such harm. Schools were basically invented, fast forwarding into the industrial age, which I think was you know, fantastic in many ways, but the schools that we are in today are actually a result of the industrial revolution's needs, right? It's because they want more, better, faster things. And ever since the educational system as Ken Robinson said, has not evolved. Some are trying, but it's not there yet. So schools affect, as you can imagine, not in a very positive way in my, in my views. Society, on the other hand, is extension of family. So yeah, society helps, put some parameters for you. And at the same time, governments come in and throw in a really nice, interesting mix. And in the last few decades, companies have managed to come in and play even a bigger role, brands, right? I'm a hardcore Mac fan. That's part of my identity. Hell, that wasn't there 20 years ago. Or I'm a Harley fan, or, or I'm into this and I'm into that. So all of those factors actually come in and do something to our, to our brains. They start entering every single neuron, every vein, and help us start to compartmentalize certain thoughts, right? And what that happens is it basically starts 
a certain scientific process in my mind. I tried to take a couple of surreal things uh, of which I had absolutely no understanding or idea, and I tried to be scientific about them. Again, being insignificant, choose to challenge me or totally ignore the bull that I'm saying. But it kind of works in my head. If you, take two, uh, if you take birth to death, which is you know, the lifeline of any person, and you try and create a variable to map against, and you call it expectations, right? Expectations. It's very simple. The day you're born to the day you die, there are expectations. There are even expectations of you as a fetus in the womb before you're born, right? No, you know, no pressure on, on, on any fetus in the room, but there is, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of expectations. <laughs> and as you go up, you know, life goes up and down, so your expectations go up and down. But the net takeout from this, it's very simple. More is expected of you as you go older, right? Simple. Agreed? Now, let's take something <clears throat> a little different. Um, can someone just throw me a bottle of water? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, something really interesting happens when you take a slightly different... Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Wael. I wasn't going to do a demo. I was actually going to drink. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> thanks. Okay, something really interesting happens when you take a slightly different parameter called creativity, which you can talk about in a little bit more detail in, in, in just a few seconds. And we map it against birth to death. And this has been proven, right? It's a very simple scribble or a doodle. It actually decreases. I was alarmed when I realized that at the age of five, we actually have 80% of our capacity to be creative. By the age of 12, it's down to 3 to 4%. Yeah, no, I want, <gasps> right? That's bloody alarming. That is scary. I mean, by the age of 12, school, parents, society has managed to kill our creativity, right? That's, that's a simple message I'm trying to give you. Now, it gets even more interesting for me, at least, when I try and map those two against each other on the same grid, right? There's a bit of a boo-boo happening here, right? <laughs> it's a bit scary because what's happening is an inversely proportional relationship that nobody's taking into account and we are sort of talking about it very metaphorically and very um, creatively and philosophically with people over, you know, coffee and tea and all sorts of other things that people drink in the evening, right? But what is really happening to make it? Let's move forward. What this does is it, in one way or the other, reflects on us in a very simple and naive way. It makes us think harder, faster, longer, uh, anything else with an er at the end, with, an, with a very simple and naive objective of making things better, right? Our life better, our work better, whatever it is better. Bear that in mind. To get a bit of more understanding, I think it's important to study the brain a little bit. And I am the last person on the planet to claim any kind of authority or understanding or significance on the brain, but I'll tell you something that you probably already know. But before I get into that, the reason why I'm doing this is to try and get this question of who am I not be asked by artists and people who sit late at night and dwell on the meaning of life in a very philosophical, artistic way. It is for us, every single one of us, to actually stop and think about it. Let me tell you about the brain. The brain is actually made up of two parts, right? Left and right. And I think that I knew a few, you know, a few years ago. But what's really interesting is if we look at the functions or the areas that touch or, or that, that actually do the work in each part of the brain. And again, please bear with me if you already know this stuff, but the first thing is logic, right? On the left side. On the right side, it's feelings. I think we pretty much all know that. Well, as we move forward, there's detail. We like to, we like to see things in detail. You, you find engineers and doctors and, and all sorts of people that are more left, left brain driven to be very meticulous, attention to detail. Other people, on the other hand, that use their right brain more like to look at the big picture, right? Very quickly, left brain facts, imagination on the right brain. Fantastic, that's why kids have great imaginations. Words and language versus symbols and images. Present and past versus the future and the present. Math and science, philosophy and religion. Comprehends, gets it, knows, believes. Religion to me is an extremely right brain activity that takes place. Acknowledges, appreciates, Perception, the name, reality, forms, practical, and I think the most important one to get to is safe. I've just broken a huge rule of presentations, which is putting more than seven words on, on the slide. I do this for a living, but I gave myself the license to do it. The reason why I did this is to try and explain to you there is extremely distinct difference between both sides of our brains, and very few of us actually understand it and see the value in it. 
The last one is really important for me because of a topic that I think has been touched upon by a lot of the speakers, which is safe and risk-taking. If we continue to be left brain, we're going to take less and less risks and we're not going to be able to quantum leap in life. I don't believe in marginal improvement. I believe in quantum leaping. Now, all of this sort of dawned upon me and, and I tried to relate it in one way or the other to um, a very weird, it's, it's a kind of a very weird uh, concept